Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to listen to our presentation today. Um, I'm, as she said, my name is Sue Washer with AGTC. We are publicly traded on the NASDAQ, so here's your forward-looking statements. As a highlight, AGTC is focused in orphan ophthalmology. We have a long history of being technology focused. We were started by five academic scientists in the AAV space, and so we have deep expertise on how these vectors are designed, manufactured, and delivered. Uh, we have a broad intellectual property portfolio, both developed internally at the company as well as through collaborations. Uh, and that has resulted in a broad pipeline of products that we're going to talk about today, as well as we're one year into a key partnership with Biogen. So this is our pipeline, um, and it is focused on our lead programs. What you'll see here is that we have four indications that we're taking into the clinic. Two are in the clinic already. Two will soon be in the clinic. These are all orphan ophthalmology indications. They're genetic causes of loss of, that results in loss of visual function. And the other thing I want to note on this slide is that through our partnership with Biogen, we have partnered two of these programs to them, but we have wholly maintained other programs internally at AGTC, notably the two chromatopsia indications, as well as our first foray into larger markets in ophthalmology, and that is a program in wet AMD. Also, unique to our partnership with Biogen is that once we see all of the phase one, two data for either the XLRS program and then the XLRP program, we do have the opportunity to start paying into that program and be able to share um, in the profits of that program 50-50, or we could just maintain the milestone and royalties agreement we have. We think this gives us a really unique opportunity to have a future opportunity to rebalance our portfolio and reassess the programs that we're working on, and that is at our sole discretion. So I talked about the fact that we are a technology-based uh, company. And what that means is that we have a deep expertise, as I said, in how these vectors are put together. And th this results in our approach to how we design our products. We do not believe that gene therapy, even AAV gene therapy, is a one-size-fits-all. It's a very complex product with capsids and promoters and gene cassettes and formulation and delivery, and all of these must be carefully designed and matched to meet the specific indication that you're working on, and you have to know the cell you're going after, the clinical phenotype you're trying to correct. And we are agnostic as to what the parts need to be to put together and who we need to work with to bring those parts together. What we're passionate about is putting the right parts together to get the best clinical outcome for our patients. So why ophthalmology? I think that many in this room understand that ophthalmology has been a very attractive space to work on in gene therapy. And first and foremost, it's because of the high unmet need. There's only all, there's almost 300 different genetic causes of uh, loss of visceral function, and that results in about two or three million patients throughout the world that suffer poor visual function that affects their quality of life and impacts uh, the economic outcomes. There was also growing scientific evidence. Many of you know that many of the early uh, clinical data, preclinical data in animal models showed that the eye was a very good space to work on. One of the most important things to us was the robust clinical endpoints that you have in ophthalmology. There are many ways to uh, measure visual function, electrical function, uh, how the, the electricity moves back through the eye, to look at structural improvements, and so that to us said that we could have a very good opportunity to develop straightforward clinical trials to assess the utility of these products. So this is the eye. I'm not going to make you memorize all the kinds of cells that are in the retina, but I use this slide to show just how complex that one little organ in the back of your eye is, the retina. And if you look at what is your uh, right-hand side, you'll see that the retina is highly structured and differentiated, many very specific cells, and when you work in the retina, you have to understand for each clinical indication what cell are you trying to get to. 
where are you going to make a difference for that patient in their visual function? And that's why, if you think back to the slide I showed about being able to put together a very specific vector, the caps of the promoter, the delivery, we have to match that up to the clinical indication because of this high level of differentiation in the back of the eye. So our lead product uh, candidate is a treatment for X-linked retinoschisis, or XLRS. So XLRS is caused because there's a missing structural protein in the retina, and that causes those specialized cells I guess talked about to be pulled away from each other so they can't talk to each other. And if they can't talk to each other, then the electrical function that we recognize as vision can't get to the brain. And so these patients have very poor visual acuity that cannot be corrected with eyeglasses. They can't drive. Their, their visual acuity is, is poor enough that they can never get a driver's license. And importantly, 30% of them have a chance at some point in their life of having a retinal hemorrhage or detachment, which then can be a catastrophic effect upon their vision. We currently have this product in clinical development, and we recently announced that we had dosed eight patients in the clinical trial, and that the product, except for mild to moderate inflammation, was very well tolerated. And that mild to moderate inflammation either resolved spontaneously over time or with tr standard treatment with steroids. Importantly, also, this inflammation was not correlated, at least in this small initial data set, it was not correlated with pre-existing antibody titers, it was not correlated with post-treatment um, elevation of antibodies, and it was not correlated with any CTL response. So we pay, take this as a very good sign in the initial parts of this study. We've recently d more than doubled the number of clinical sites participating, and have a high degree of confidence that we'll be able to move through the rest of this clinical trial uh, very effectively. So these are the endpoints. I'm not going to go into a lot of de data here, but I talked about the, one of the reasons ophthalmology was attractive to us was because of good clinical endpoints. And for XLRS, the two clinical endpoints we think are the most important are visual acuity and visual fields. And people uh, are pretty familiar with visual acuity, not so much with visual fields. The important thing to remember about visual acuity is it's only measuring function in the fovea area, which is a very small percentage of your whole vision and your whole retina, whereas visual fields gives you an idea of the visual function over the whole uh, surface of the retina. And for XLRS, we've got all this delamination and splitting occurring throughout the retina. We think visual fields will be a very important endpoint. So the next indication that we have in the clinic is a potential treatment for achromatopsia. So achromatopsia is another orphan indication, about 30,000 patients in the U.S. and Europe compared to XLRS, which is about 35,000 patients. But there the similarity ends. This is a very different disease. Um, it's a cone dystrophy. So this is a disease where you have cones, which are one of your two photoreceptors. You have rods and cones that are photoreceptors. And the cones are there in the eye of these patients, but the cones don't work. The photon of light can't get in the cone to trip the phototransduction cascade to result in vision. Uh, what this means is these patients are all legally blind. Uh, they are also extremely light sensitive. They would be not tolerant to the big bright white light shining in my eye over here um, because cones are what gives you the vision in lit conditions and they only have rod vision. They also only see in black and white and shades of gray. This is not to be confused with X-linked color blindness. X-linked color blindness, you only don't see one color. Most of your cones still work and you have normal visual acuity. Uh, that's not the case in these patients. So this product is also in clinical development. We recently announced that we had dosed the first two patients in this clinical trial, and it was proceeding according to plan. Again, we've got multiple sites throughout the U.S. involved in this study. Many patients screened through our natural history studies that we have ongoing for all of these indications, um, and we are confident we'll be moving through this clinical development program um, effectively. So the endpoints for achromatopsia, a little bit different than XLRS, visual acuity again, it is one of the gold standards, but then color vision is also an approvable endpoint as messaged by the FDA and the EMA, and because these patients have no color vision at the start, uh, we expect to see a change in the color vision ability of these patients as well. 
So the next uh, product that will be moving into the clinic in uh, 2017 is a treatment for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. You already heard a, a, a presenter talk about retinitis pigmentosa. So it is a very large um, indication, but retinitis pigmentosa as a phenotype is caused by genetic defects in many different genes. So if you're doing gene replacement like we are, you have to look at it gene by gene. And X XLRP, X-linked RP, um, is mostly caused by defect in a single gene, and it results in about 20,000 patients in the U.S. and Europe. So again, we're doing a gene replacement effect uh, 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 product here. There is a very, very good large animal model, uh, a naturally occurring dog model of this indication, um, and all of the work we've done to date that's been published shows that when we deliver the correct gene to these dogs, we can improve uh, their visual functioning, and as visualized in this slide at the bottom here, you can see that the blue layer, which is the photoreceptor layer, in the treated portion, portion, there are many more healthy photoreceptors in that area of the eye, and that's what results in the very good uh, improvements in their visual function. So what, one of the things I want to talk about is the team. I talked about the fact that we were, we were founded by five scientific founders in the world of AAV gene therapy, but we also have an excellent internal team. Uh, we have ophthalmologists on board. We have a, a senior team that has a, a great amount of experience across both small companies and large companies and really has the expertise and experience to move these products forward. Also, IP, uh, I talked about earlier that we are, we're kind of technology geeks and we're, we're, we have deep expertise within the virology space and we care about how we design these vectors and put them together. And that means we've done a lot of work on IP internally and with many other partners, most notably recently has been our partnership with 4D Molecular Therapeutics in California. They have a vast library of different kinds of capsids that we're screening through for future purposes. And also Sympromics, which is a small company in Scotland that has the same kind of library approach to promoters that drive gene expression. And we think these will be very important tools going forward. So we recently announced we are also going to move into the world of otology. Um, and this is an area where we're putting some effort in on the research side. Um, otology for us is very similar to ophthalmology. It's another sense that is very important to humans. It's another organ that's a contained space. And once we started looking, it's also another place where there are multiple genetic defects that result in hearing loss. So you can develop another suite of programs like we have in ophthalmology. And then also, the physical structures and the cells in the ear are fascinatingly similar to those in the eye. So there are hair cells in the ear that are very like photoreceptors in the, in the eye in that they turn waves of sound into electrical signals, like photoreceptors turn waves of light into electrical signals. Then there's ganglion cells in the ear that take that electrical signal back to the brain just like they are in the eye. So we felt this was a space where we could apply what we had learned in ophthalmology to a very unique space where no research work has been going on, no new products has been developed in hearing loss since cochlear implants. And, and we think it's, it's time for an advancement to be made. So from a financial summary, we're very strong financially. Um, as of June 30, which is our year end, we reported that we had $173 million of cash on hand. Uh, at the end of our next fiscal year, we expect to have between 100 and $120 million of cash on hand. And those uh, financial resources, together with the team we've put together and the new facility we recently moved into in both Florida and uh, Cambridge, we have the resources to get the clinical data on our lead programs, XLRS, Acromatopsy of B3, the second acromatopsy indication I didn't take the time to talk about, and XLRP. So we have the resources on hand to get four sets of clinical data, which we think positions us very strongly to make good decisions about our next indications and have a rich opportunity to move forward into pivotal trials. So I'm just closing with to remind you of our pipeline um, and the company highlights, but Thank you for your time and attention today.